Hello, I made this video a few years ago, little wooden tank thingy, which unfortunately did not work very well because the motors that I'd chosen to use were just a little bit too weak and useless to drive it very well. But there were some comments on that video about maybe using a so-called hoverboard to do this because it would be much stronger, higher torque and so on. And that set me off on a whole new adventure. I, I don't know why I let you guys comment on these videos. It costs me a lot of money sometimes. So this video was brought to you by, let's see who the culprits are. Three of you this time. Andre Sobrego. Gamer Paddy. Nickel Dominator. What are we going to do with these guys? So once I realized that this hoverboard thing that they were talking about was not, in fact, a science fiction thing that does not work on water unless you've got power, I got a hold of one and played around with it and found that, yes, you can fiddle around with the firmware and make it radio control, and yes, it does have pretty good torque and very controllable speed and just sort of a, a nice little bit of equipment for the money that you'd pay for it if you get one secondhand. So once I'd satisfied myself that the claims of the aforementioned three culprits was correct, Basically, from that time onward, I've been designing this thing in some form or another, mostly just daydreams at the beginning, um, and I started off using QCAD, just designing everything in 2D, and went for quite a long time, actually, in 2D. This was before I'd ever touched FreeCAD or used any kind of a CAD program, except for SketchUp. I, I don't know if you'd really class that as a CAD program, but anyway. So it was a long time ago, and we've gone through dozens and <laughs> probably a dozen different um, layouts and designs, and, well, they all look, all look the same here, probably, but... Anyway, um, yeah, it's been a long time in the making, mainly because I, as I got more into it, I could see that it was going to be quite expensive, uh, and that just kind of put me off a little bit. So then about a year ago, I got Starlink internet here, so after getting fast internet, I was able to use Onshape again, because you kind of need decent internet for that. And I started a, not quite a complete redesign, but um, from the ground up design in a proper CAD program, which is what we're looking at here. Obviously, this is um, a little bit more imagination than finished product at the moment. We only have a, a bare skeleton and none of this nice cladding. I'm hoping for it to be amphibious, so that's why the hull looks a lot like a boat. Um, but anyway, I began to realize that after three years, this idea had still not left my head. So despite it no doubt being expensive, it just wasn't going to go away until I actually made it. So what we're about to see in this video is a very, very early version, I guess. Uh, a whole lot of temporary parts. The wheels are just made of MDF, the tracks are just homemade stuff, um, and yeah, there's a whole lot of stuff that will change. The biggest one probably would be that I'd like to get some of the tracks like this eventually, but these, I checked into this, they're going to set me back about 800 bucks, New Zealand, so uh, I didn't really feel like doing that until I'd at least confirmed that the hoverboard motors and everything was going to work nicely together, and um, so that's why I made some home, a lot of homemade stuff just to check that all the sizes are right and everything first. So I don't know if I'll ever get to the point where I'm, you know, spending this kind of money on it. We'll see. But anyway, I'm not going to talk too much about the design here or why things have been done the way they have been done. Some of the reason things have been done the way they've done been done is because I have a lot of, a lot of this 6mm aluminium plate to deal with, and so I've got to do something with that. And I wanted to try TIG welding, and I wanted to try TIG welding aluminium specifically. And so that was expensive. I actually bought a CDC TIG welder to get this project done. Anyway, maybe in the future I'll talk a little bit more about certain um, design considerations. But for now, let's just get to looking at something being made. Look at that, no problem at all. So now I'll just put it down. Wow, and I have really good control over it as well. So it seems like it takes about 1.8 amps to hold that vise off the ground. If we just lift it up again. Uh, yeah, so 1.85, 1.86. Oh, it's so easy. It actually feels better when I go a bit faster because it doesn't cog as much. Man. Oh, well, oh, the chain came off. So what happened there was the chain came off. And I think the reason it does that is because it has some inertia when it's moving. And then if I suddenly let it stop. That's full speed there, by the way. Oh, okay. So if it's in line well enough, it doesn't jump off. But it's holding itself on there pretty well. I mean, it's going fast enough that the, the shape of the chain goes kind of funny here. Because, like, one side wants to... See, that side wants to... Keep going in that direction.
nice. Okay, I'm just getting ready to weld these two side pieces onto these crossbars that go through the middle. And I'm really happy about the way everything's lining up. This is the first kind of project I've done like this. Well, I made a bench for the CNC, but this, this is a little bit more um, technically demanding, I guess you could say, with all the things that need to line up. But I'm really glad that I took the time to make these jigs, because, boy, did they help. And if you look here, the edge there is lining up beautifully. Most of these other ones are as well, and on, also on the other side. In fact, the only places that they don't line up nicely, like this bit here, see this one on the right, that's mostly, I think, due to my um, the mitre saw that I have doesn't cut perfectly straight. It cuts sort of on, a, on an angle like that slightly. Um, and I think that's the only reason. The other thing that doesn't line up is this one here. You can see vertically. It's a little bit of a vertical offset there. And that's due to the fact that this main beam that goes all the way down here is actually bowing up a little bit like that and that's probably just due to these welds because it wasn't like that before um, so there's uh, welds along the top here only on the top and no welds on the bottom so what I'm thinking is that when I put welds on here hopefully that piece there will straighten itself up a little bit again and one thing I've discovered about these welds is that a, a butt weld like that where you're just joining two flat edges along um, while they are very easy to do like that because you don't need to add much filler and it's um, 
nice flat surface for the gas to flow over is nice and controllably. Um, so that's great, but they, they're not that strong, <laughs> I've noticed. Because um, initially, I was wondering if I'd need to put fillet welds in here, and I thought maybe just these ones on the side would be enough to hold it. But I, I stood on the end, I stood on this piece, and I pulled on one of these ones, and almost immediately it started to put little, little cracks in the, um, the butt weld on there. So I put fillets all, all along these ones here as well, and I think that's going to be necessary, unfortunately. Okay, that's all the cross pieces welded in, or tacked in anyway. And everything went pretty well. Um, this alignment here doesn't really matter, but it turned out quite well, so I thought I'd show you. Um, there's a little bit of a gap there and there. And that's touching, of course. Um, but yeah, that doesn't really matter, but... Uh, Nice to see that all this effort that I put in to get everything straight actually made everything nice and straight. Just made a bunch more of these parts and I took this opportunity of doing such a repetitive task to push my router a little bit and I discovered that it can go about three times faster than what I was doing previously so that's nice to discover. But this is really a job for a laser cutter isn't it? I mean look how much, look how much of this we've wasted. Okay, I have enough of those arms now to set up one side like this with some temporary MDF wheels just to get a, a sort of a idea if it's all going to fit together as I'm expecting. Seems to be alright so far. So my next task is to finish these welds on here properly. They're just tacked in at the moment. And then I've got to set up all the stuff over here which is actually going very well. I'll take that out because it's kind of getting in the way. I wanted to show you the uh, the ruler that I've got sitting at the back here. Got a little groove cut in there, which is going to be for this uh, angle. Just a little bit of reinforcing to go on the back, and the ruler is sitting in there, and it's supposed to be 460 millimeters, and it is exactly. So that's nice. Whoops! Now I have a new challenge. <laughs> I've got to stick this back on. I'm pretty sure that if I just tack that back on where it was, that cavity underneath should be able to build that up. So that might actually be an interesting um, little challenge for me to try. There we go. Well, it was quite annoying at first that I had to do that, but I think it was quite good practice. Okay, so I finished off all the welds in those parts there and on the underneath as well. And as I suspected, that has caused this this um, long piece along here to pick up a bit of a bend in the opposite direction. So now, hopefully you can see it's bending downwards. It's not really what I wanted. I would have been okay with it bending upwards a little bit. Down is kind of annoying, but I'll just try and ignore it. Um, it's possible, I guess, that if I did a little bit more welding on the top, I might be able to bend it back. But I don't think that's really necessary and I'm spending enough money on argon as it is so the next step is to uh, tack in this stuff here and I've got everything set up in the perfect position got my vice grips on here to make that shaft uh, perfectly coaxial there not really important but I'm just using that as a like a positioning um, item to get everything else in the right place and used a bit of wire here just to hold that piece on and everything is lining up pretty much to the millimeter. Okay, I have those pieces tacked in there now, and everything is still lining up nicely. Uh, got the motors in here just for a placement test, and um, you know, just to get a general idea of how they're going to feel in there, and make sure nothing's hitting where I wasn't expecting it to. And these drive shafts turned out quite nice. They're a 12 millimeter bar in a 13 millimeter hole, so it's uh, just a little bit of space there because this is where we're going to have to try and waterproof it the most, I think. Or at least this is where something's rotating that needs to come through a waterproof orifice. Um, and they're fairly well positioned or fairly well concentric in these pillow blocks. I can just fairly easily just sort of slide them still. So 
so that's nice. I was a little worried they might start to get jammed up if these these two pillow blocks weren't very well aligned. For these steel rods that I'm using for the drive shafts, I needed some way to connect the bicycle chain sprocket to the wheel on the outside. So what I decided to do, just for now at least, this is the first uh, you know first attempt at it. I got some of these cheapo flange, uh, whatever they are, and I cut some keyways into here, key seats, with my. CNC router which is not made for doing this kind of thing. The spindle um, can't really go too slow because it doesn't have air cooling or it might not have enough air cooling coming through it if it's spinning slowly and it doesn't have enough torque at the low speed so if it suddenly stops apparently like if it binds up um, and but the current's still trying to go through the motor coils you can damage the spindle so I wasn't able to go very slow and my tool holding um, facility here is not very good just some pieces of wood there um, so I was having quite a bit of trouble with it. This one here is the worst, I think. <laughs> oh well, I know it is. Um, and this was because it was getting very, very hot and there were sparks flying everywhere. And the wood that I was holding it with, um, I guess it just sort of got a bit soft or something. Another problem I had was that the this bit here was all heating up. And it seemed like, is this got hot or... Yeah, I guess it's from the heat. But it was trying to push in but the tool was sliding up inside so I couldn't really uh, cut. Anyway, so I managed to cut some keyways like that and then I bought an arbor press and a keyway brooch and I broached some keyways into there and I made these little aluminium plates for each side like that. So there's another keyway there and then they're going to sit into it's another keyway you're going to sit in there and we should have very strong contact and torque between all of the parts of this. So it was a real pain in the ass to get to this point but I think the result is going to be quite nice. So that's how the drive shaft or the output shaft piece looks when it's all assembled. Um, these bolts here are a little bit <laughs> too long, I need to get some shorter ones but this is fairly straightforward. Um, what's not so straightforward though is at the motor end, we need to connect the back of the hoverboard motor, which is basically just a flat plate like that, and we want to connect it with this. So what I came up with is I made this adapter plate that goes between them, and it just has six M5 threaded holes around there, and four M10 holes to go into the um, chain ring. And importantly, on the back of this, if we turn it over, we'll see that those M10 holes have a pocket machined around the outside of them and the purpose of that is so that we can put our chain ring bolt in like that and it sits flush with that surface so that we can then turn it, turn it over and put it down like that and we can bolt that flat down and then to connect the adapter plate to the motor I've just made six holes in here and on this particular one I just eyeballed it uh, um, so I machined this on the CNC obviously, but then I used these holes here and a transfer punch just sort of got it what looked about like about the right place and punched some marks and drilled and then on the back we need to have massive big countersinks because we're going to use 
these sort of bolts to uh, hold it all together and they can't stick up too much maybe half a millimeter or so is okay any more than that I'd be starting to worry so that's why these holes are actually quite a lot larger than where's my bolt they're actually quite a lot larger than M5 now and it means that on here we need to do quite a lot of countersinking as well but I think it's not actually such a bad thing because it gives more surface area of the bolt to be pressing against the aluminium of this when you when it's trying to turn with lots of torque you know by the way the ratio of sizes on these chain rings here is not ideal this is 32 teeth and that's 22 teeth so it's about two-thirds the size but that's the output side so what that means is that we're going to get 50 percent more speed from that trans transfer of power and only about 66 percent of the torque that we might have gotten otherwise so it's kind of the opposite of what we want, but the reason why it ended up like that is because, for one thing, I had already bought these, so I wanted to use them. And the other thing is that this um, adapter plate, this inner circle here, it can't be too small because it will be hitting on the, um, the, the block that's going to be here where the hoverboard motor shaft is to mount everything. Um, so at least for this first iteration, that's how I'm going to do it. In future, I might sort of come back and maybe try and use this size sprocket on the back of the hoverboard motor as well but the problem with that is that then these um, holes need to be quite a bit closer to the center and they might I haven't really measured it up yet but I think they're going to be very close to where this lumpy bit is here and it might not work out so easily as for the chains um, I measured this up before and rather conveniently we can make two of the chains that we need from one single bicycle chain so I didn't have to go and buy two of these I just you know, broke it apart and um, that's all we need. That's about two-fifths of the bicycle chain and then the other one's the other two-fifths and then I have a, a fifth of the chain so that's what's left over. I'm going to try making some tracks with this rubber that I found on New Zealand Foam and Rubber I think the place was called. It's four and a half millimeters thick and a hundred millimeters wide so it's perfect for what I want and it's nice and flexible so it should turn around the um, sprocket or the drive wheel and everything all right it's called insertion rubber because it's got a little bit of fabric in it like you can see it's see the edge of the fabric unfortunately it's a little bit stretchy but I'll give it a go and see how it works To join the ends of the track together, at least for this first like test, I'm just going to overlap them and use some slightly longer rivets to rivet into the teeth here and uh, just join them over like that. There's going to be a bit of a bump, but it's not much of a bump. Right, that seems to be seems to be pretty good actually. Slightly better than I was expecting. Uh, it stays nice and straight. Uh, biggest problem now is that these teeth, a little bit of sag here, um, and they're whacking on here. They weren't whacking on there now because I was lifting it up like that. But if I just turn the wheel, then they they whack on there quite <laughs> quite a bit. So my plan, at least for now, is to put a bit of this um, very thin aluminium flat bar. Okay, I just zip tied that piece in there here and one rivet at the front so that it doesn't slide that way. Uh, it's still quite noisy, but it doesn't um, 
doesn't bounce as much on these points anymore. It's a bit clattery, but I think it's going to hold together pretty well. Oh, there's still a lot more travel we could go there too. This can go another couple of centimetres forwards if we need to. But it's already holding, holding the tracks fairly close here, like there's just a tiny gap there, like about one centimetre or so between these two. So that's good. Even when we catch some air, <laughs> When we do a massive jump like this, the track should stay there, maybe. Okay, I mean... Whoa! She's pretty clunky, but... Should be good enough to make another track at least is what I'm thinking. Okay, well, once to turn around in circles, we're not going to be getting full power out of it. Okay, so the smooth the smooth hard aluminium of those teeth there's not enough to... You're just slipping on there. But I think if they were rubber that probably wouldn't happen. Alright, so I've got both motors and both chains and sprockets and drive shafts and everything. It seems to take forever to set up, even though this is only for a quick test drive. Um, so the one channel for each motor at the moment, so I have to set up a like a Elevon mixing. So this radio will do the mixing just for now. I'm hardly touching the stick. It's quite hard to control it slowly. Oh. Oh, come on. Ah, oh, yeah, it's the same problem as we same problem as before. When you go backwards, there's not enough traction. And not enough grip on the See, the one that's going forwards, I'm trying to turn right here. The one that's going forwards is fine. Whoa. Oh yeah? Who wants to turn left? Wow, it's still... I have to like, steer to the right like this, just to keep it going in a straight line for some reason. Yeah, it doesn't... That's yeah, very, very difficult to turn it that way. Oh, I forgot to set the endpoints. I mean, I did set the endpoints, but the funny thing about these radios is when you set a screen like this, when you exit out of the screen, you have to, and then long press here. Yeah, that's better. Now it wants to go a little bit to the right, but. Oh, it's much easier to drive though, of course. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure if the, um, yeah, it's just given up. I'm not sure if the, the mode that I'm using is the best one. I'm using velocity mode. It's still only in the 20s though, this thing. So nothing's, nothing's getting hot. I don't think it's, 
overheating. It could be just that this hoverboard battery that I'm using is sagging and it just can't handle delivering the power that's being asked of it to do this. Okay, that's full, full speed. Well, it's 40% because I've got my thing set to 40% endpoints. So it could go about twice that fast, maybe. Something like that. It's doing all right. I mean, the tracks are holding up, and the suspension and everything. It's just the, uh, I think it's just the battery is the weak point here. I'm starting to feel like I could use some, uh, some jo could use some gyro stabilization because there's a I almost feel like there's a little bit of lag like when you make an input to turn left say it doesn't do it immediately so you put in a little bit more and you get this pilot induced oscillation turned itself off again. Okay, so I think I'll just leave it there for today. The, the battery's obviously having a hard time of it. These are getting a, uh, fairly warm now. Um, but from what we could see there, just skidding around and stuff, I'm pretty sure the tracks and all the stuff that I designed <laughs> is okay. That pin is still in there, that's good. Um, it doesn't look like the track's going to fall off. They're the right length. The suspension seems to be working all right. The tensioning thing's working. The sizes of all the parts seems to be about right. So I'm pretty happy with that. Doesn't look like I need to redesign much at all. Probably probably nothing. There's no way it's going to drive up there, but I just want to get it close so I don't have to carry it too much. Oh, wait a minute. Oh no, it turned itself off. So you could see that as soon as it turned itself off, it fell down because the motors were actually working to hold it up there. That's what that velocity motor's doing for you. And it's nice, but you have to keep in mind that the motors could be doing a lot of work and you're not aware of it because you just, you know, you're not doing any inputs. So yeah, I'm not sure if that's the way to go. But let's see if we can get up, up there. <laughs> it would be nice to uh, finish off this by getting up there, but I don't think it's going to happen. Okay, I mean, saves me some work. Okay, I put two, two batteries in parallel there now. They're charged to 38.2 volts, which is as far as I can get them with the thing that I'm charging with. Uh, so we should be able to figure out whether it's the battery that was at fault or something else. And in the last run, a couple of the teeth, or one of the teeth fell off, and I had to rivet that back on, but there was no other damage that I could tell. Oh, so, so, so. See if we can get down here a little bit more gracefully than last time. Oh, and I changed my um, endpoints from 40 to 43 in this, so we should have a little bit more top speed, but I don't want to go too much more. All right, straight up the hill here. Seems fine, yeah. So I think the problem was just the battery before. It was uh, not letting us go up hills much. That's full speed though. Doesn't seem to be much faster than last time. Oh dear. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to happen. I think we might need more preload on here if we want to avoid that. Or we could just not try and turn so aggressively. Oh, that, that 
track or both tracks came off there. I guess because we slid sideways down the hill maybe. That's weird, they weren't having this much trouble last time. Well these tracks are a lot easier to put back on now. So what I'm thinking is maybe the this rubber stretched a little bit. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Yeah, this this is quite different to last time, isn't it? I'm pretty sure what we just did there would have been perfectly fine before. It was only a few days ago that I last drove this, so not sure why it would change that much that quickly. See how easily I can get these on now? Oh. Yeah, that's the track is stretching, that's why. Well that's another thing that wouldn't happen if we had the real track. Oh, what's this? Somebody's put an obstacle in the way. Not quite, huh? Not really. It's kind of cheating, isn't it? <laughs> kind of cheating to use momentum, but if we had a... See, what I'm thinking is eventually uh, we've got 40 cells here at 20 and 20. And I'm actually thinking to have a hundred and put them about here. So be a little bit more weight on the front. Oh, come on. Ready, go. Oh yeah. Not a problem. Just don't turn too sharply. We're good. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm getting the idea. <laughs> Don't do that. I thought it'd be right because it's on the dirt and it's dirt. It's less less friction to pull the tracks off. I wonder if we can climb all the way up there, like in one shot. That's probably going to be the end of the battery if I try that. Oh, what? Like it's nothing. Okay, so... Oh wow, it almost got... No way! Wow, it almost got all the way up that bit too. That's really steep there. Well, that, that confirms that the problem that we're having last time was just the battery wasn't up to it. So now that we've got two batteries... It's okay. See how steep this is? I'm not sure if it's going to show too well in the video, as usual. Oh no, it's... Okay, so now the battery is really... Yeah, it's beeping at me.
What the hell? Who put these concrete blocks in the middle of the lawn? Um, I'll just have to drive over them. I need to straighten it up a bit. It's probably not going to work, is it? No. Alright, let's see if we can drive in here with those those uh, blocks there to help it. Okay. Alright, well that's going to do it for now. Uh, it's nowhere near finished, but I think I'm going to have to put this aside for a while and maybe focus on some projects that might actually make me some money instead of pissing it all away on things like this. Yeah, so it's not finished. There's no hull. Um, there's no top on it, no lid. I'm, I was going to make a, a lid, so that it, a waterproof lid, you know, so you can open it up and put things inside and there's a whole lot of improvements that need to be done obviously I'd like to get some real tracks not these homemade ones that are all stretching and instead of using bolts here um, looks like they, they're working alright but they're not really appropriate because at some point they'll probably come undone and definitely these ones here there's lock nuts on the back but I think they'll um, come undone at some point so ideally this should be done with a, just a smooth uh, rod with a C-clip on the end or something like that. Shocks are doing all right. I uh, actually bought a whole new set of springs. These are the ones that originally came with those Traxxas X Max shocks. So these are like the default ones. I found a place on eBay that was selling like thicker springs. You probably can't tell in the video but they're slightly thicker there. So I bought a whole new set of those because these ones were just looking a little bit soft. And there's no oil in these shocks by the way, that's why it was sort of a bit bouncy. Um, but it ran pretty well like that. I'm not really sure if I could be bothered putting oil in them. Um, seems like a lot of work for possibly not that much of an improvement. And the ones, the ones on the road wheels are set to about half of the preload, I think. Yeah, like that. And these ones here have no preload. Uh, so that's how it was running. So I could twiddle around and adjust those a little bit. In particular, the one at the back um, this wheel was hitting in here occasionally and that's not really great so having a bump stop or something here so that it stops just a little bit before that would be nice but the biggest problem by far is the gearing on here it's just not really what we need uh, we, we don't want to gear it up in speed and down in torque uh, we want the opposite so I'm thinking I might actually redesign most of this section here the reason it ended up like this, by the way, is I'm trying to make it very, very low profile. So you can see the top of that aluminium piece there is actually underneath the track. And at the bottom, well, the reason we, we want it to be low profile at the bottom is so that we get lots of ground clearance. There's a huge amount of ground, ground clearance, which I'm quite pleased about. So at the moment, the, the top of the tracks here, which is the highest part of it, is about 30 centimeters. But we have 165 mil ground clearance, so that the from the top of here to the like the top of the hull to the bottom of the hull is only about 14 centimeters. It's just slightly larger than the motor. That's the idea. Um, and in order to fit those back sprockets in there like that, with the bar on the top and a little bit of a uh, space on the bottom as well, they had to be smaller. But I think I'm just going to have to forget about that kind of fanciness. And I'm just going to have a bulge, <laughs> a bit of a bulge on the top here, around this section, and then it'll probably go down a little bit and then flat here. And it'll, it'll won't be as cool as I thought it would be to look at, so I thought it'd be nice to have it, you know, just flat like that. But uh, in the interest of having it actually work properly, I think we're going to have to redesign that section so that ideally the small sprocket will be on the motor, large sprocket will be on the drive shaft. And as for the rest of the system, I wasn't holding out much hope that this would work well. I thought it would get too hot or something. But to my surprise, it hardly even warmed up compared to the motors, which um, after that last run, they were getting quite hot. In fact, one of them, I, I couldn't hold my hand on it. That's how hot they were getting. Um, but this, I could hold my hand on here no problem. And it's not even on a proper heat sink. This is just plywood. Uh, eventually, it'll be mounted to the frame, I think. So then it will have lots and lots of heat sinking into the aluminium frame. So I'm actually thinking maybe that'll be alright. And batteries, of course, they were okay. Uh, the more the better, and that's not really an issue. I just put a little drink can there because I was watching some of that video, and it doesn't really um, 
the, the size of it doesn't really show on the video. It looks really small, but it's actually quite big. It's like, I think, 1160 mil. Um, yeah, 27 kilos, or 28 kilos, I think, with the second battery on it. Anyway, that's all for now. Thanks for watching.